cleansing, health, well-being, and sickness. He says uh, there are episodes, not fragments, as proposed by postmodernism. Uh, then the tension is suspense and not the indeterminacy of postmodernism. That's on uh, page 44 to 45. Um, this idea of uh, eco an ecological grand narrative has modernist features. Uh, the view that expertise is needed to find the true meaning of everyday details. Um, trivial experience has indirect significance, which you cannot get through common sense. Uh, or the disturbing idea that we do not understand the effects of our own actions or intentions. The negative principle of self-deception. Bad consequences are amplified because they are unacknowledged. Uh, we cannot control what we refuse to notice. Uh, I find all of this unique because he actually says that postmodernity is slipping into the strange history of those futures which did not materialize. He says that on page 74. Yet he also says of the new ecology narrative, he says, of course this is late modernism, decentered, fluid, transmitted by the news, but it has exactly the cutting edge of the earlier phase. So his idea of what I will call a a radical modernism, which is a term he uses on page 74, um, it's vastly different from the classical modernism that one finds in the early 1900s. I would say it is a, it's a tempered modern, modernism. Had to enjoy a little coffee there. Um, it's a tempered modernism, one that is not quite so hopeful. It admits that there are problems which still need to be overcome. Uh, it contains a new sort of relationship between uh, democracy and science. Scientific studies can and will be interpreted differently by the powerful party, as decided by polls and politicians, and it makes and they make the final judgment call. So while Meyerson's idea of a radical modernism is different from the modernism of uh, the late nineteen of the early nineteen hundreds. It contains these elements of postmodernism also, yet it, it doesn't really cross the bridge and go over into postmodernism. Um, he's evidently, uh, he says, drawing on the ideas of Ulrich Beck, uh, whom I'm not familiar with. So uh, my analysis here may be incomplete. Yet it seems that the evidence for Meyerson's argument is purely circumstantial. Uh, said another way, he's reasoning from the small to the large, um, or inductive reasoning. Uh, this makes his argument tentative, though perfectly logical. For example, I could argue the exact opposite. Uh, here in the USA, President Obama and the, De uh, the Democrat Party are trying to pass health care reform. The public, at least according to pollsters, uh, does not want it. Yet the elected Democratic officials are using silence to back their claims that the reform is needed. Or they're using science to back their claims that reform is needed. Uh, so, so are the opponents of the reform. The media has contributed to the fragmentation because Fox News tends to make uh, or to take an adverse Fox News tends to take an adversarial uh, position to the administration and the Democratic Party. Uh, the network has far more viewers than other networks. So I could argue that postmodernism is afoot. Yet, it too is, a deduct is an inductive argument subject to criticism. Uh, don't get me wrong, I greatly enjoyed this book. I think its conclusions just may be a little overstated. Um, it was a great read. It probably took me an hour and a half, two hours to get through it, and th but I was really thinking about it while I was reading. It's about 78 pages long. Um, when approaching the Bible, modern scholarship tends to want to do so from a postmodern perspective. Walter Brueggemann's idea of the plurivocal nature of the Old Testament comes to mind. Um, he, he brings that to bear in his, um, his Old Testament theology, which was published in... I believe 97. Um, one could also mention Leo Perdue in his book uh, Reconstructing Old Testament Theology After the Collapse of History. Uh, those two are actually friends and, and work from somewhat similar 
viewpoints. Uh, yet, if postmodernism is a future that, that never played out, then the way we read the Bible is greatly impacted, right? There must still be some proper way to read the text. There would still be some unilateral validity to the proper conclusions. One might say that the Bible remains normative for life and culture. Uh, these ideas are not certainties, but are intriguing options for a hermeneutical method which exists in an era which is radically modern instead of postmodern. So those are some of the ideas that I got from uh, from reading Meyerson's book, which I found, once again, very, very intriguing. Uh, then on the blog, you might have seen that I posted that I have this uh, insane goal of trying to read 200 books this year. The reason I'm calling it insane now is because I don't think I'm going to make it. And here it is, what, week, week three. I think I've only got through only made it through f four or five books so far so <sighs> I'm lagging behind and I just don't think it's gonna happen uh, but moving right along here I uh, watched a watched a really interesting PBS special it's called uh, affluenza you can uh, you can google it and find find it, information about it um, when I watch stuff like this I can't help but watch through uh, through my filter of being a Christian who who values caring for God's creation and uh, and also uh, my values of uh, of technology and art, I, I enjoy technology. I <laughs> I find art very stimulating, but uh, not much of an artist myself. So my first impression was that this is a <laughs> cheesy movie. Uh, it's it's got some cheesy 90s kind of stuff in it, early 90s kind of stuff in it. But once you get past that, the film is good uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being great, 5 being average. I would say it's about a 6, but uh, the movie points out the problems of a consumer culture such as the one we Westerners, we Americans live in. Now, it was interesting to me that the critics of a consumer culture in the movie were such a diverse group. Uh, they even interviewed Focus on the Family uh, in the movie. You see, I myself have been dealing with my own uh, affluenza for a couple of years. Uh, when we, and I use we because I've done it too, when we buy things that we don't need and we throw away things that are perfectly worthwhile, we are experiencing the beginnings of affluenza. Eventually, the material things don't give you pleasure anymore and the things start to take you over and get you depressed and that is according to the movie affluenza becoming full-blown I think th that the uh, the diagnosis of a country with affluenza could be made and I mean us we Americans waste much more than anyone else does in the world, and I hope you'll join me this world in uh, this year in trying to live a simple and uh, and uh, very very um, simple life that doesn't waste anything that we don't have to. I think that's part of living the way that God intended it. So I hope you will think about those things in the coming week and. Uh, and just uh, anticipate with me the wonderful things that God is going to do for us and through us this year. And that's it for this episode of the Conservative Christian Ecology Podcast.